tourism is now the world's fastest growing industry. According to the World Tourism Organization, 635 million people traveled to a foreign country last year. Between them, they spent 439 billion US dollars, making tourism the world's number one export earner, ahead of automobiles, chemicals, petroleum and food. And in the next 15 years, increased affluence, especially in China and Central and Eastern Europe, means that the number of people travelling will double. It's already the case that 200 million people are employed, directly or indirectly, by the tourism trade. That's one in eight jobs. But all over the world, there's the worry that while it may create wealth, tourism can be an environmentally damaging and an unfair business, and that the people in the developing world especially do not always enjoy the benefits or see the profits from tourism in their countries. Tourism is often developed as an industry, because it's a cheap industry to develop, that will bring in foreign exchange. So when a country is being structurally adjusted, tourism is often recommended as a way forward. Tricia Barnett is director of Tourism Concern, a London-based, European-funded organisation that campaigns for fair, responsible tourism. The truth about tourism is that the wealthy can visit if they choose, less affluent countries. And Western tourists really like to know that when they go on holiday, they're going to be surrounded by home comforts or probably things that are better than they get at home. They want their air conditioning, they want good vehicles, they want food that they can understand and appreciate. And very, very often this is all imported. The tourists will probably go on a foreign-owned flight and might well stay in a hotel which is not owned by a national of that country or fully owned by a national of that country. Thirdly, a great deal of what the tourist will consume might not have been produced in the country that he or she is going to. It might well have been imported. So while we're paying for a holiday, maybe only 10% of that will actually stay in the destination. And I would add that out of that 10%, in some research work that's taken place, it has been found that, say, for example, the Maasai in East Africa whose culture is so much appreciated and valued by the tourist because it looks so exotic and wonderful, often gets not one penny out of those monies that the tourist has paid to come and might well have been removed from his home because actually he's living in a conservation area. In Kenya, tourists have been visiting since the 1920s. But it wasn't until 30 years ago that large numbers started coming on safari holidays to see the world's wonderful profusion of wildlife. This part of the world, where the great rift valley with its lakes and forests gives way to vast open plains dotted with acacia trees, is home to lion and giraffe, cheetah and leopard, elephant and zebra. It's every child's picture book of Africa, every tourist dream. <laughs> National parks were established to protect the animals that the tourists pay to come and see. But sometimes it's been local people who have really paid the price. <laughs> If you look at a map of East Africa and see where the major national parks and game reserves are, you'll find that virtually all of them are located in areas that were previously Maasai land. This is Jake Greaves Cook, a Kenyan who has worked in the tourism business all his life. Now, the Maasai occupy areas of land that tend to be open savanna woodland interspersed with acacia trees, and they're ideal for grazing for wildlife, but they're also ideal for plains game like zebra, wildebeest, and all the animals that are associated with the national parks of East Africa. Because the Maasai were very warlike, they kept other people out of their areas. They engaged solely in cattle rearing, and they didn't get involved in killing wildlife. And so you'll find that there's large numbers of wildlife in the areas that were formerly occupied by the Maasai. Then national parks were set up, and the Maasai had to move out of areas like Amboseli and the Maasai Mara, which are now reserved exclusively for tourists and safaris. 
The Maasai gained some benefits from the national parks because there was a degree of revenue sharing from park fees from visitors. But quite honestly, they have missed out as well because they're no longer able to go into those areas which were important as uh, dry season grazing areas because there's permanent water there. So many of them resent the fact that they're no longer able to use their former rangeland and that they've been reserved exclusively for tourists. They also felt that they'd missed out on some of the income. You will find in many of the safari lodges and camps, the employees are not Maasai. They're outsiders. Morning. Hello, how are you? Fine, thank you. Good. Do you like to have a glass of sparkling wine? Uh, oh, no, no. Well, it's it's morning. No. Just, just orange juice would be fine. Okay. At this lodge in the Amboseli National Park, south of Nairobi, most of the employees are from the city. It's a popular place, dominated by the distant outline of the snow-capped Mount Kilimanjaro, just over the border in Tanzania. Tourists are driven around the area in stripy vans to see the animals, who don't seem to mind posing for photographs. For old hands like Jake, this kind of park experience is, far from being wild, quite tame. Thirty years ago I was living in the Masai Mara, and at the time that I was there, there was only one safari lodge in the whole of the reserve. And I've been going back regularly over the years, and I've seen quite a few changes there's a move towards a far greater degree of mass tourism with large numbers of visitors, which can have an adverse effect on the environment. Which is why, 35 kilometres from Amboseli, Jake has started Perini Ecotourism, a new kind of tourism venture, one in which the Maasai people can have a share of the money earned from tourism and yet not give up their traditional way of life completely. Certainly the days when the Maasai could range undisturbed over vast tracts of bushland are over. A hundred years ago, there were 10,000 Maasai people. Now there are 380,000. And this, together with an unreliable water supply, has meant overgrazing of the land. At the same time, other Kenyans have come spilling out of the cities, wanting land for small holdings. Much of the Maasai land that hasn't already gone to the national parks has been sold and chopped up into parcels of what is usually pretty unproductive farmland. Our concept is to persuade the Maasai to set aside an area of their land. In this case, they have 150,000 acres here, and we have about 10% of that set aside as a conservation area. Our organisation, Porini Ecotourism, leases that land from them and has put in the infrastructure to create, in effect, a private game reserve that belongs to the community. So we've put in roads, water holes and a tourism facility, a small camp which can accommodate eight people. We're basically managing and running the conservation area in partnership with the local community. And the income that is generated from the lease payments and from the visitor entry fees go direct to the community to fund various projects. Is this tent? Who's sleeping in this tent? Um, Charles. Charles. So is the sheets clean on it? So, yeah, the sheets are clean. I've just done that. I'm just doing the toilet now. Okay. And the shower? The shower's getting done right now. In the Selenki okay. tented tourist camp, Tanya and camp manager Doug are doing the domestic work and being helped by Maasai tribesmen. It's the first time that these men have experienced paid employment. It seems to be working well despite the language barrier. How do you say dry? Dry? Dry. Kausha. Kausha. Okay. The Maasai people who are here in, in the camp itself are from the Selenkai um, conservation area. They actually are part of the group ranch which the conservation area covers, which the conservation is on, should I say. And they are all typical Maasai. They've all got families that live in the area. Their cattle stock is in the area. And they're all traditionally clothed. We don't change any of that. They basically live the same as they would live at home here. At the camp. See, look, and here, look. We've had to train them up a bit, yeah, but um, <laughs> it's proving a bit difficult on that front, but it's great fun and they're absolutely enjoying it. <laughs> the conservation manager for the Selenki area that Perini is leasing from the local population is himself a local man, though he has been away for education and to build his career. His name is Emmanuel Onetu. I come from a village called Lengisim, which is not too far from the conservation area, almost um, 12 k's from the Puruni camp. 
I'm a Maasai by tribe, specifically Kisongo Maasai from Loitokitok region. And uh, I belong to a Selenge group ranch, which has leased a portion of land to Purini ecotourism. What makes the Maasai people to be a little bit more different from other tribes is one, the Maasai people are the only communities who have lived and maintained their cultures. They are not fully kind of intermingled fully with other communities like the Westerns or other types of people. The Maasai people have, are still wearing their own traditional attires. They are still have their own customs and practices and uh, uh, they have also their taboos, or, uh, the dons and the do's. And uh, they are the people who have also remained with wildlife, really staying with wildlife uh, since uh, the very beginning. Uh, it's only areas where Maasai people are living is the only areas where wildlife are found around in, in the whole Republic of Kenya. And that makes them really quite a unique sort of a community. Normally the Maasai would be herding cattle and stuff, but what with working now, they're no longer at their homes. So it's left up to their wives and their children to look after their cattle. They're basically earning money now, which is even better, especially now that things have changed in the world, especially for them. They have to go out and buy their vegetables and stuff, and they never used to have cash. So I suppose it's a bonus for them that they're actually earning some money now. Living by cattle herding alone is no longer possible. It's not just because land is short or because of the need to earn cash, but because education has given Maasai like Emmanuel a different view of the world. Me, from myself, out of the change I got out of education, it passes on to my children. They wear clothes, they stay in a decent house, not a hut. So moving from the hut, moving from the Masai attire, uh, definitely it's a significant that that is a change. So by doing so, I accept that slowly education has changed us. Secondly, the trend of climatical condition, lack of rain, prolonged droughts and famine have also forced the Maasai community to change from livestock rearing, depending lively on livestock only. They go for crop production and they go also for wildlife conservation and then people also come to work. Like now, for instance, Purini camp, you are seeing Maasai is working here. It's difficult in the old days, about 20 years ago, you can't see a Maasai coming to serve somebody. No. He sits to be served anyway, he sits to be given. But now we have changed slowly. Good morning. Is it well? Mm, very well. Wake up call. Pre, pre wake up call. Woken by the Franklin birds, the visitors to the Perini camp are going on an early morning game drive. It's amazing. <laughs> There's really a sense of being in the wild at Selenkeir. The animals are less used to humans than in the parks. They tend to be more furtive and shy. But there's none of the radio contact between safari vehicles, which happens in some parks, so that four or five vans converge on the same herd of elephant or a leopard if one is spotted. And what kind of ants did you call those? It's called an ant lion. An ant lion. And it's, um, it's a sort of larval stage or an intermittent stage in the development of a... It's like a little... Dragonfly. The tourists have been coming to the camp for just a year now. Before that, work had to be done to get access to the area, track laying by the Maasai, which is still going on. On the ride out, we come across three men in their distinctive red robes, hard at work on the road. <laughs> When we started the conservation area, there were no roads here at all and there was no access to this area. It was just a wild, untouched tract of land. Now, in order to patrol the area and make sure that the animals are safe and protected, we needed to put in a network of tracks and we also needed the tracks for access for tourist visitors. So, three years ago, we started building the roads and we built them all by hand, employing up to 20 members of the local community. 
We've cleared all the tracks using farm implements like these traditional African hoes that you can see them using here. And this has meant that we're now able to take visitors around the conservation area and the rangers are able to carry out patrols to see that the wildlife are protected. Also, the wildlife tend to use the roads, particularly the lions. We find them padding along the roads rather than sort of trekking through the bush. But as you'll see, we've kept the roads very narrow. We want to have the absolute minimum impact on the environment. Everything is totally reversible. The roads, if they were left alone, would soon revert back to being grass again. And the camp has been constructed without using any permanent cement or features like that. Everything would just be taken down and removed, and within a very short time it would just be straight back to nature. Along with camp duties, road work is a new source of employment for the Maasai, a second kind of income from tourism, over and above the money the community receives from the lease of the land. <laughs> He said that uh, since I got employment, I have never sold any cow of mine or a sheep whatsoever for food. Yeah, and uh, also regarding the medical uh, point of view, when, when my children or I, when I feel sick, I have something to pay for the hospital and get uh, treated, and so I didn't have any problem major. There's been quite a few opportunities for the local community to get work. First of all, constructing the roads, and then we also employ 10 game rangers whose job is to look after the wildlife in the conservation area. And then we've also got the camp attendants, and we have a chap who looks after the borehole and the pumps. So the, the people are, are happy to have these opportunities to gain employment in an area where otherwise they would have no chance at all of having a job. As well as the roads, there's another important piece of infrastructure here. Two boreholes have been drilled, a windmill pump repaired, and a generator and pumps have been installed so that water can be pumped from the boreholes to fill up water holes for wildlife. This has increased the reliable water supply for local people who, especially with recent droughts, desperately need water for goats and cattle. It's a perfect example of how what works well for the local community can work well for wildlife too. The renewed availability of water has brought animals back into the area. Elephant have returned. There are impala and gazelles, warthog, wild cat, mongoose and ostrich. Jake and the team have built viewing platforms in the trees so that visitors can have a clear look at them. One of the nice things about Selenge is you can get out of the vehicle. I often feel that people miss so much when they're in a minivan with the engine running the whole time. Once you get out, you can hear the sounds of Africa and you can smell the earth and it's a whole different feeling being much closer to nature. We go up the ladder to the platform. Look, they're underneath the trees, those there. Those are guinea fowl. That's adultering guinea fowl. No, oh, they're, they're helmeted guinea fowl. They're helmeted, yeah. sorry. There's masses of them now running in. Our rangers' camp is over there, and there's, you can see a couple of rangers going off. They carry out foot patrols throughout the conservation area to make sure there's no poaching or snaring. But uh, there really is no poaching or snaring of any sort now within the 150,000 acres that the community own here at Selenge. We had a lion kill right here, right in front of the platform. Yeah, a few months ago, Oryx was uh, ambushed by lions as it came down to the water. Is anybody watching? Did you see it? The game rangers saw it. The lion has a special place in Maasai life. In days gone by, the killing of a lion was a rite of passage for a youth becoming a moran, a warrior. Young men would go out for several months into the bush, killing and eating meat to make themselves strong. It's a tradition reflected in Maasai songs and dances. They're going to do two dances for us. The first one is based along the same lines as um, when the Maasai become warriors, uh, Morans, they, they go out and they kill a lion in the old traditional way. Um, that's what the first song's about. 
and they get a name from that. They all get a certain name from it. They all get a certain body part from the lion as well. Um, enjoy, please. <laughs> Now there are new songs that the Maasai sing about conservation. Amongst the younger generation, anyway, attitudes are changing. Well, originally they saw the wildlife very much as a nuisance, and large predators like lion, not the favourite animals of the Maasai, but they're now quite happy to tolerate lions, even when they occasionally get their cattle killed, and they no longer kill the lions in the way they used to. They used to be very keen on going out and spearing the odd lion from time to time. So they've, they've changed completely in, in their approach, mainly because they see now that the lions will bring in tourist visitors who will contribute um, a fee and generate some income towards their own community projects. So they can use the wildlife to, to help themselves survive as a community. Having had this idea of conservation, the Council of Elders within the Selengay community have really had uh, lots of campaign, really, trying to convince youngsters of girls not to continue uh, pressing the warriors to continue killing uh, lions. Instead, they could really discourage and form a formulation of songs and praise that they could be having conservation, they could be really conserving wildlife, be it lions, uh, elephants or buffaloes, or even cheetahs as well, because the young boys, the hearts boys also used to practice by using dogs, really to hunt uh, cheetahs or leopards. But uh, of recent, those campaign has really discouraged them. They have seen that the lions really generate income to them, same to cheetahs, same to leopards, and same to buffalo or elephant. In theory, at least, the modern test of Maasai manhood is the ability of a father to educate his children. So anybody who has um, a child in school, she's able to pay school fees for his child, whichever, whichever amount being charged, education or for books, he's able to buy books or a pen or anything. <laughs> Well, education is something that's very important for the Maasai people. In the past, they haven't been educated and they've often tended to lose out to their neighbours who are better adapted to live in the modern world and to cope with the challenges of living in the 21st century. So they're very keen themselves to have quite a large proportion of their youngsters educated so they can take their place in modern society. One of the things you've noticed about the Maasai is that when they've gone to school and they've had an education and been to university, they still want to live here. They still want to live in their traditional areas. Emmanuel also happens to be the chairman of the, the school parent teachers association, so we have quite a close connection with the school. Not too long ago, the children here would have been taught in the open air, under a tree, by a single teacher. Now things are different from well, tourism and wildlife. We have had a donation from Kenya Wildlife Service through WDF funds of an allocation of 200,000 shillings, Kenya shillings, to put up two permanent classrooms for the school on behalf of the local community of Selenge. And where later the community themselves, together with Purini Ecotourism, had put up some funds also to construct another one extra classroom, which is now being used as grade eight, as standard eight in the Kenya system of education. So the school is now a full, complete primary school with eight classrooms. And it has five government teachers who are teaching the pupils in the school, where there is a headmaster and a deputy headmaster and the rest of the teachers. The tourists who come to the Purini camp get very close to the Maasai and their way of life. It's not unusual for them on a walk with a guide to end up in a village like this one, so different from the new traditional villages which have been built for the tourists in other parts of the country and which are really a travesty of the real thing. 
This is a real typical village. The village itself is really kind of fenced around with thorn trees and it has all enclosures of goats as you are, you are seeing in front of us. The ones of the goats and then the ones of the cows and then the open center point in the middle of the village is where the cattle are kept. The cattle are mixed up with donkeys and big cows and uh, small cows are kept separate. Goats, young ones in the, in the village are kept inside the house. And these are typical Maasai huts. You can see that they are constructed uh, with cow dung and uh, dry grass. They cover it on top and then they cover with the cow dung. When you go inside, there is a bed for a mother and a bed for a husband. And then there is a sitting area where the children and uh, husband can have a small stool. And there is also a, a campfire where they do the cookery. And then they have a small kind of wooden shelf where they put their cooking pots and cups and kentos. The Maasai are living here very much in their traditional way. And we don't want to create a situation where the place is overrun with tourists and there's a, an impact on their way of life. They don't want that themselves either, but they're happy to tolerate small numbers of tourists here. Indeed, they welcome them because that helps to ensure their survival and helps to pay for things that they need. But we're keeping the numbers small. I mean, our camp only accommodates eight people. We only have one vehicle. So we want to make sure that the level of tourism is small and that there's a very small impact in terms of visitor numbers. We've seen what happens in other areas when you have large numbers of tourists and it becomes over-commercialized. It does become, in a way, a little bit like a sort of theme park, a sort of Maasai Disneyland, and we want to avoid that completely. The whole objective and aim is to enable the Maasai to continue living as they live in control of their own lives, but providing a source of income from an alternative use of a part of their land, which is, as you can see, semi-arid, dry, not really suited to rearing of livestock, but ideal for the wildlife that lives here. Of course, the conservation area did cost money to establish, more than $300,000, and there are annual running costs of about $50,000. But Jake is confident that not only can the company recoup its expenditure, but that the scheme can be used elsewhere in Kenya and more small tourist camps established for the benefit of both people and the animals with whom they can live in harmony. I'm very interested in doing what I can to assist in conserving the wildlife here and I strongly believe that the only way the wildlife outside the parks is going to continue to exist is if you involve the local community and demonstrate to them that they can have benefits from continuing to conserve the habitat and providing a safe haven for wildlife. I'm very delighted, very delighted because our expectation or the expectation from the initial beginning of the idea or the proposal has met our key expectation, and that makes one happy. Children are getting bursary, schools are constructed, water systems are put in order, employment is there, and also the issue of tourism introduction has also made a change because the, the community is getting now a double income, which was the ultimate objective of the project, is to generate income for the local community to get something as an alternative of livestock rearing that makes them very, very pleased about it.